This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch launch a successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com. What up, crowdfunders? Salvador Brigman here with the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in here today and for learning a little bit about crowdfunding, how it works, how to get backers, how to get traffic, how to launch a successful campaign on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. That is the basis of this show, really arming you with the knowledge, with the strategies, with the tactics, the things that you need to do to improve your chances of raising money from the crowd and also to build a crowd, quite frankly. Um, How do you actually get people interested in what you're doing online? How do you get them to actually part with their hard-earned dollars and buy into it and support your project? That is the topic of this podcast. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about one of the major, major service providers in this industry, the Gadget Flow. So the Gadget Flow has been a sponsor of my podcast for a while. I think it's been probably since, actually, I think it's since it started. This has been like two or three years now. They've also been a sponsor of my work before that. So I've known Evan, I think it's for about four years now. Uh, so we, we've had a lot of back and forth. We've gotten to know each other over the years. I've hung out with him in person in Brooklyn, New York, you know, etc. We both got to see the crowdfunding industry grow and mature. And also we've we both worked with many different crowdfunding campaigns. So he's come on the show today to number one, share education with you, to give you tips and things you can apply to your campaign, the things that he's learned having helped so many other campaigners out there, and really the things that you can do to make it so that you're setting yourself up for success. So that is number one. But number two, he also is going to give you a bit more of a transparent look behind the scenes in terms of how the gadget flow works. A lot of these major service providers, they're kind of mysterious. Like you don't know how they work. You don't know who's using them. Aside from like a scattering of reviews online, you don't really know what actually goes into that kind of a company. And there's also not really a face that you can interact with and get questions answered in these different things. So I wanted to have Evan on because I know how passionate he is about helping the crowdfunding community. And also, I think the fact that he's, he's worked on so many different campaigns that he can share a lot of good resources. And finally, to, to finally get a, a hold on what who should use services like his who should use the gadget flow? What actually goes into their promotional offering? Is it right for everyone? And how do you know whether or not this is something that you should move forward with? Because he actually does turn away uh, many of the people who approach him looking for help with promotion. So I want you to get a clear and transparent understanding of what goes into their operation. And I also ask him a few questions that I think (laughs) raises his blood pressure a little bit, like the differences between Kickstarter and Indiegogo and some of the common objections, like the price and what can you actually expect When you buy one of these packages, I ask him those questions that I think most people want to know. So you're also going to hear from him on those issues. Now, the the last thing I want to mention here before we dive into today's podcast episode is if you want to be notified of any new content I have coming out, any new blog posts, any new stuff in this upcoming year, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. Just enter your email address and you will join my weekly newsletter there. That is C-R-O-W-D. 
crux.com slash subscribe and I'll notify you of new specials that are going on, web classes that I'm having, new videos that are out, blog posts, etc. If you want to be get a notification when I specifically release new podcast episodes, then you'd have to go onto the iTunes podcast app and you'd have to hit subscribe there. And that way they'll be automatically downloaded to your phone and you'll get a notification when new podcasts come out. So that's really the easiest way to stay in the loop and the easiest way to make sure that you're getting access right as I unveil it to new strategies and tips and information as it applies to crowdfunding. Without further ado, let's get into today's podcast episode. Evan, I am really excited to have you on the podcast. You've been working with me, you know, sponsoring the show, being a follower of my work. Um, I've just been incredible, honestly, in the last few years to get to know you, you know, hang out in Brooklyn, New York, get it, you know, get coffee together, all of these different things. And I'm really, I'm really excited to get into your story. And also, you know, what your website can do for all the listeners of the crowdfunding demystified podcast. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. I'm honored to be here today. So can you can you take us back a little bit? You know, when I first when you first came onto my radar, this is about maybe two, maybe three years ago. Is is when I was first getting started with the podcast, and you just kind of reached out to me, and I started to learn a little bit more about what you do. But the number one thing I took away was that you just want to get into the middle of educating crowdfunders. That's sort of getting good information out there for people to learn from, and really because you know there's not much in the way of education when it comes to Kickstarter and crowdfunding and these different things. And that's sort of where we started to begin to work together. What I'd love to ask you is, when is it, what, can you give us the origin story of the gadget flow? Like how did this become a thing that you've been working on for the last few years? What is the origin story of your website? Sure thing. So uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree from, from shipping and finance, which is totally relevant, right? Compared to like our industry. Um, I started my own media agency back in 20, 2011. Uh, we ran it for about a year, and part of our, our like uh, in-house project was Gadget Flow. As soon as we realized its potential, like about two months after we launched it, we basically closed the entire media agency and focused 100% on Gadget Flow. So Gadget Flow is a product discovery platform that basically reaches at this point 25 million people on a monthly basis. Uh, what we do is that we curate 12 new high-quality products every single day. We've featured more than 12,000 products so far uh, within 140 categories. Uh, we're a team of 28 people headquartered in New York. Uh, we're also the third largest Indiegogo partner and listed on Kickstarter and Indiegogo as experts. And uh, we've worked with more than 6,000 brands at this point, including Sony, Polaroid, Bang & Olufsen. Uh, and among them are like more than 4,000 crowdfunding campaigns as well. And this all started in Greece, is that correct? Yes, uh, during, during the economic recession here, uh, back in 2012, we're three Greek co-founders. So it was definitely challenging in the beginning, like scaling gadget flow, especially the first year. Um, but I mean, we, we figured out our business model quite fast, I would say, within the first uh, six to seven months. Um, we're self-sustained as a business as of today. Uh, we haven't got any kind of like funding yet. Um, so yeah, that's really hard though in the economic recession and also outside of the United States, like the entrepreneurial culture is just completely different. How, how did you actually, um, from number one, I guess, start the business, but also how did you, you even decide to like focus on this? Why is this a passion for you? For sure. So, I mean, I am, I actually, I was into coding, into design, um, and initially the idea of gadget flow uh, came to us because we realized that there was a gap in the market. Um, so you, on the one hand you have like, you know, huge companies like Amazon, uh, in which you can definitely spend hours looking for that, just one product that you've been looking for. Right. Um, and on the other hand, you have like, uh, other blogs and publications like in gadget and Gizmodo, uh, that they offer you some sort of like the curated, like gift guides and, uh, roundups of products. Uh, but also these long, uh, like in-depth uh, reviews of this product, right? So we realized that there was a gap in the market. There wasn't, there wasn't like one, just one place in which you could literally find unique, high-quality products that you wouldn't otherwise uh, discover through like another website. You'd have to spend like hours on Google and checking like roundups from BuzzFeed or Gizmodo, right? 
Um, so the reason that we're passionate about the entire team, not just me, um, is because we we simplify online product expiration. So, you know, we the value that we offer as a brand to our users, because we're both B2C and B2B company, right, um, is the fact that they can quickly discover something interesting, something uh, innovative uh, that they can either buy for themselves or for their friends, colleagues, or family. So it's kind of like for people that are avid buyers of a lot of the products, honestly, that you will also find on Kickstarter. Like these are gadgets, design products. They're just kind of cool things that you don't hear about very often. Like maybe you see it uh, every once in a while on like a social media feed or in some kind of a news article, but you've really created a collection of these products. So people that, that just love these types of things, they can go there and they can discover it. 100%. Exactly. That's uh, that's the point of our platform. You know, we just uh, we present the products in the most beautiful way uh, with just a few high quality photos, a video. And then there's a description of about 100 words every time highlighting the main features and how each product works. So if you're like commuting, if you're like on the subway um, and, you know, like just as uh, when you're like scrolling on Facebook you can just do exactly the same thing with Gadgetful, right? Like when you're discovering something new, whether that's um, you know, a gadget or modern furniture or even like uh, a wooden mug or something, you know. Um, it's products that you probably won't see on like uh, Amazon or yeah. like uh, – any other website, you know? Yeah, exactly. I think one of the things that when we started to, when I started to get to know you a little bit, one of the, the common people that we sort of look up to is Gary V. And as you know, he's based in New York. You know, he's this yeah. kick ass entrepreneur, you know, working long days, just really just banging it out, um, taking names and getting lots of results. You know, as a major social media agency, when you were, when you were building this company, you're going up against, number one, it, it's difficult to build a company outside of the United States. But also, when you're building a company for the first time, you have to figure out problems, and you have to motivate yourself, all of these different things. Um, what, what is your role here when you, when you were growing the company? Like, what were you doing? Are you, are you, you know, the marketing guy? Are you the design person? What, what did you do to, to make this company a success? Pretty much everything. So I basically coded and designed the first version of Gadgetflow. Um, then I was obviously part of the hiring process, then part of the sales team, like marketing, uh, operations and everything in between, right? Like as an entrepreneur, uh, you have, you must wear like, uh, so many different hats in when you're building your own company, right? Cause you, you have to understand how, uh, each and every department works, especially in the beginning, because you have the opportunity to adjust everything, uh, based on what you think is right in a way. Right. Um, so it's definitely challenging. You have to make a lot of sacrifices, especially if you're like young, right? Um, you, you have to sacrifice. For example, I've sacrificed my early 20s, not just me, but the other founders as well. Because um, when you're working like 14, 15 hour days, you know, you, you just, you know, you don't have the courage to just go grab a dream right after, right? Um, so it's definitely challenging. You're basically getting punched in the face every single day. It's, it's all about uh, problem solving, I would say, you know? There are lots of problems every single day, uh, no matter what you know market you are in. Um, you'll just have to figure out a way to solve all these problems every single day. Um, so in terms of scaling it, um, it I mean, it depends on your market from our side. Um, I mean, it took us about a year to just get it up to a point which it was it went viral right after, right? Uh, we haven't actually done any kind of like paid ads or uh, paid user acquisition up until uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. So for for us, it was uh, all about scaling it organically, especially like since we were since we were like a self sustained company. Uh, obviously, cash flow was the issue, right? So we were trying our best to get the word out about our brand and scale it organically. Mm -hmm. And what do you think has been the, the for you at least the hardest part of from going from the startup to where you are now? Has it been the the motivation? Has it been finding teammates? What, what's been the hardest part of the process for you? Definitely not the motivation, right? Because you're building something or that that it's like your own, right? You're not working for someone else like your the usual nine to five, right? Um, so you definitely get the motivation like uh, on, a, on on a, as soon as you wake up every morning. Um, in terms of like, um, uh, in terms of like the most challenging thing from my side, I would say 
is hiring the right people. Because you're looking for people that are going to be scaling with you. You're not looking for people that are going to be looking for the next paycheck, you know? Um, so people with like uh, high emotional intelligence, uh, hungry to learn and scale with you. So that has been by far the most challenging part so far. Um, and if I could change just one thing, it would be for sure to just hire them faster, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you definitely reach a point which you just can't do everything on your own or with just the founding team, right? So it took us a few months to realize that. We're literally working, like I said, 14, 14 15 hours a day. We still do, right? Um, but doing stuff that you can just simply outsource to like other people, other departments, so you can focus on scaling your company. So lots of entrepreneurs, too many entrepreneurs that I've been talking about, entrepreneurship in general, um, they basically make this mistake early on. So if, it, if you can just walk away with one thing from today's podcast, it would be to just hire the right people much faster uh, than, than you're anticipating. And to make those decisions quickly and not deliberate and question and all these different things. And honestly, I think it's honestly better to make a bad decision and correct it than to just like deliberate for the next few months. I think you're actually, you're really good at that. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a rare skill. I want to get into a lot of the different things, the things that you've learned in terms of crowdfunding, Kickstarter, the things that people can take away if they're trying to prepare for a successful uh, crowdfunding campaign. But before we do that, I did have one other question. And I think you're in a very unique position because we're, we're around the same age. You have a very successful company. Now you're giving talks around the world. You know, you're working with these big brands. You have cool like apps coming out, augmented reality, like all this cool stuff you're, you're happening. Mm -hmm. um, from your own experience, what do you think is the difference between the people like you that are able to make it to a certain degree and the people that just kind of sputter and for them, whatever reason, just entrepreneurship doesn't work for them. What do you think that the big difference there is between these two categories? So I guess it's determination for sure and willing to get many punches, like I said earlier, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. People just prefer to just have their you know usual nine to five, their safety, their cushion and everything, you know. Uh, and they just move on with their lives. They, 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 they don't like taking risks because entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is all about taking risks every single day. Um, so not everyone is willing to do that. And it doesn't always pay, pay off, you know? Um, like, for instance, it's not guaranteed the fact that you'll be working 15 hours a day that you're going to make money or that you'll be successful as an entrepreneur, as a CEO. Um, that's not 100% certain, you know? Um, so you, you got to work a lot um, to, you know, just for you to be ahead of your competition, like if they're like, if you have like five competitor companies, for example, um, imagine that they're working eight to 10 hours a day, right? So if you're a new company trying to uh, penetrate their market, you got to work much harder and much smarter as well, uh, than them, you know, in order to reach their level. What do you think about location, though? Because you did move from Greece to New York City. I know we were just talking before the call. You do have people working for you that are in London or different areas around the world. What decided or what motivated you to move from Greece to New York? So, uh, yeah, we do have like our team is at this point 28 people. Uh, we have people from West Coast, uh, East Coast as well, Europe, Singapore. Um, I mean, what motivated me? It, it's it's no brainer. Like the fact that New York City is like the place to be for willing to like scale your business, you know, and succeed. It's like, uh, in terms of networking, you, you can literally meet everyone at a bar, you know, or at a coffee place. Uh, and it's, you know, the most convenient part from my side is the fact that you can literally, you know, grab, grab, grab a cab or just, uh, move around with a subway and just meet pretty much anyone, whether that's your customer, whether that's a partner that you've been working with, because most companies, um, you know, or, you know, they have an office in New York city, right? Yeah, yeah so exactly. It's, it's can, yeah, it's super convenient for you to scale your business, have meetings and just move much, much faster. And now I think this is actually a major difference because for a traditional business or a tech startup kind of like yours, I think networking in that way matters much more. But when it comes to crowdfunding and Kickstarter projects, it doesn't matter as much where you started from. You can be in a remote state within the United States. You don't necessarily have to be in California or New York. You can literally start it anywhere and you can gain access to a crowd of people online and you can really leverage your online presence 
in that way. So I want to get into some of the stuff that you've learned, you know, having worked with, I think you said 6,000 different brands, et cetera. What have you learned that you can pass on to the listeners in terms of if they want to launch a successful Kickstarter campaign, what are one or two of the tips that you have for them? So, I mean, it's, it's all about building a brand instead of just focusing on the product that you're working on right now. You know, you have to think long term and make sure you deliver on time, answer any questions your audience may have, your, your, your customers may have, engage with your community. Uh, because I've seen many people turn crowdfunding into a full time job, you know, launching their first campaign, raising X amount of money and then saying, oh, that thing works, you know, and they go for the second version and the third version or an entirely different product uh, within a year. So, like, try to think long term instead of just focusing on your product, uh, because this thing could literally change your life if you do it right. Now, one of the most important uh, feedback that I can give to everyone who's about to launch a crowdfunding campaign or who's in the process uh, of launching a crowdfunding campaign is basically get feedback as early as possible to to avoid having a failed campaign. Um, like we're, for example, we're also building uh, an entirely new feature on Gadgetflow in-house uh, that we'll be releasing soon. That will basically help creators get feedback from frequent backers. Like, is the price right? Is the presentation right? What would you change if you could just change one thing? Stuff like that. Small details like that definitely make the difference. Um, then you also have to consider the fact that two out of three crowdfunding campaigns basically fail. That's a fact, right? Uh, and the number one reason is the fact that they're not well prepared. That means they haven't done, they, they haven't even figured out the target audience, they haven't done any pre-marketing campaigns, whether that's on Facebook or just generating leads. Um, so I've personally worked with hundreds of campaigns, right, uh, since 2012. And I see that as the most important thing uh, in crowdfunding at this point, especially in 2017, uh, like, Getting ready in terms of like creating some sort of like even a small community, generating emails, uh, some custom like trying to, um, you know, uh, to get network, some to build up your social yeah. media, all of these different things and to to build your crowd before you actually go to crowdfunding. Uh, and I think that's, exactly. that's that's very well said. That's something that still people need to do more of and to be thinking about that pre-launch phase and also be like you said, be thinking about the feedback of the actual product. Um, do any examples come to mind of projects that you've helped um, that have gone on to then launch a business? You know, not just one off crowdfunding campaign, but actually this changed the lifestyle and changed the, the trajectory of the career of this person that launched it. Do any come to mind that you've helped? Um, I mean, I don't have just one example. There are so many different examples. One of that I can think of right now is definitely the Cubero team. They've launched the, uh, it's, it's basically a device for kids. Uh, that we've raised for them more than, more than 100,000 uh, earlier this year uh, through by doing ads, by also promoting in the Gadgetful community and everything. Um, but I also know lots of entrepreneurs as well from my side, uh, both from West Coast and East Coast, that they've been working with us for quite some time now, like since 2013, 2014, for example. Um, and like I said earlier, you can, you can definitely uh, make crowdfunding your full-time job if you pay attention to the details, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you do for them is you sort of put them in front of your audience. So if you don't have time to actually build a crowd, this is one of the, the services that you offer is you kind of get them in front of your crowd. You know, this crowd that you've built up, I think it's now like 10, 10,000 or sorry, 10 million uh, platform visits per month, which is crazy, you know, over 165,000 email subscribers. So you, you put them in front of this crowd. But what, one of the common questions that I get from many of the people in my community is, how does the gadget flow? How does how do your services fit into what some of these other people offer? So like there are other agencies out there that are offering like social media and, and Facebook ads and these different things. How, how do you, um, I guess, uh, stack up and how are you different from some of these other providers that are out there? So what we do is pretty unique. Uh, we're not like any other PR agency, right? We're not doing campaign management, for instance, right? We can help you. With, we can't help you with your pre-marketing campaign. Uh, where we where, where Gadgetflow comes in is basically uh, like two or three weeks before you launch your campaign, you can start work with us, uh, creating your listing. We have a dashboard and everything which you can monitor the performance. You can go through the entire editorial process as well, monitor the promotional timeline and everything. So our customers basically 
get uh, we, we basically promote our customers in front of our users, right? So we use our current community. We're not just saying, you know, we're going to give you just the twit and we have like 5,000 followers, right? We don't do that. Um, we don't manage, for example, your social media profiles. What we do is that we've already, we've already established, um, you know, a community that's uh, interested in tech and hardware products and gadgets in general and unique designs and everything between like travel accessories, CDC gear and so on. Um, so what we basically do is that we will place your product in front of all these people, right, um, to generate awareness and obviously backers at the end of the day. Uh, so we have like five different plans at this point, starting as low as uh, 369, go, going all the way up to 7,000 for a platinum plan. The higher the package, the, the more people see your product in a way, right? You get multiple uh, feature placement, multiple newsletters. You can also get a dedicated newsletter to our entire community with our higher plans. Um, and that's, that's pretty much how it works. Okay, so sort of like uh, email marketing combined with also social media promotion and also on your 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 homepage there. Uh, do you ever do like Facebook ads or like someone can create a Facebook ad off of your your email list at all? Uh, yeah, we're actually trying that. That's in beta at this point. Uh, we started doing that back in September because we do have like a pretty pretty large community at this point. So we're trying to um, you know like help our customers reach them even more through Facebook ads. Um, and that has worked pretty well. So cool. we'll be probably, yeah, we'll be probably releasing something uh, to the public within the next uh, quarter or so. Another really common question I get is, hey, Sal, like I don't mind spending, you know, $500 on advertising a thousand. But the question is, what am I getting back for that? Like if I'm going to spend $500 with these guys, what can I expect to come of that? Do you, do you tell when people have that kind of a question, what do you usually say to them? You know, can they expect this number of pledges or like can they expect traffic? Like what do you usually say to them? That's a great question. So about 97% of our customers generate positive ROI within 15 days. Um, the average ROI we see on Gadget for the past year or so, for the past 300 days, is anywhere between 3 to 1 to 15 to 1. Now, the value of getting on Gadget Flow, though, is not just the first 15 days of crowdfunding, right? Uh, it's also the fact that you're getting a permanent listing on our platform. So we'll continue to send you basically traffic and potential buyers, even after uh, your crowdfunding campaign is over. Even if you move like on Indiegogo and Demand, your project will still be available on Gadget Flow. So you're, at that point, you're leveraging like our organic traffic. So your product is basically visible through our search results, through our feature sections. Uh, so even after the, the promotion is way upper, we have customers that we've been sending like on a yearly basis hundreds of thousands of clicks to their e-commerce website. And they're not, they're not supposed to pay us like a commission or anything. We have, we're just charging this flat fee upfront and that's it. So the value of gadget flow is also the permanent listing that you'll be getting, whether that's for SEO purposes, whether that's for like getting additional traffic after your crowdfunding campaign is over. Uh, but also of course the, the actual values during the promotional period, right after you submit your product during your crowdfunding campaign, we'll blast out your product to our entire community in order to get you awareness and backers. I see. Okay. So one of the, the big values then is the fact that it is a one-time charge. So like if your campaign is over, you know, it finishes, you can also direct people via a link to maybe this Indiegogo in demand program you're doing a uh, campaign you're doing, or if you're selling on your website, so you can sort of continue to take advantage of the traffic in that way. But I have to ask you, so what, when then do you believe is the best time to begin with this kind of promotional stuff and not necessarily even your website, also other things, you know, that they're doing like Facebook ads, these different things. When is the best time to begin with thinking about promotion and really putting it into effect? So, I mean, in terms of like promotion in general, you should start uh, months before you launch your crowdfunding campaign. I would, it's safe to say that it's at least like four to five months before you launch your project, you should start doing like Facebook ads uh, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, to find your target audience. Uh, number two, to basically validate your product, right? Um, and make sure that, for example, you're doing lots of A-B tests with the right images, the right videos and everything. Um, and in terms of gadget flow, uh, I would say that it's, it's for you like to start working with us at least two to three weeks before you launch your crowdfunding campaign. Uh, because at this point there's a queue, uh, since, since last June, we have a queue of about one or two weeks. So if you submit it today, for example, uh, it, would, it will take up to two weeks to go live on our platform probably. 
Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So you guys have, I guess, so you, you're making sure that you're spacing out these promotions so you don't just overwhelm the subscribers. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah, 100%. Oh, and yeah. we're also basically, yeah, we have an in-house compliance team as well, uh, like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. We actually work with them directly, right? Uh, and our approval rate, because everything has to go through our evaluation, our, our internal evaluation process. And our approval rate has actually dropped because the quality of campaigns has been dropping like uh, since since the beginning of this year. So our usual approval rate used to be like anywhere from 83, 84%. At this point, is at 70%. Why so, is that? I mean, it's all about the quality of the project, right? I mean, we get so many people that they just come up with the idea, they design it, it takes them like a few weeks, um, and they reach out to Gadgetflow and other services and they're like, oh, okay, you know, now I'm going to be launching my Kickstarter campaign. I want you to work for me. I've also hired these other companies. But their product is not good enough. It's not crowdfunding material, let's just say, right? So you turn them uh, away. For sure, 100%. Wow. That, I, honestly, I think that's, that is it's, – it's one of those like things in the community where you see someone who's passionate about this product. Like they've put in the hard work, but at the same time, you just know in your gut like this is not yet ready for crowdfunding. Like They, they need to do more things. They need either to upload a video – they need to correct spelling errors. They need to have better images, these different things. And it, it's so sad to me that I think a lot of people are misled by the major media to think that you can just put this on Kickstarter and it's like instantly fund it. Whereas in reality, there's a science to it. There's also a bit of an art to it. And you have to make sure that you have a product that people want. You've put invested time and energy in making a great campaign page. So I do think it's good that you're turning away those types of people. But at the same time, we do have to, these, we have to make sure that those principles are out there so that people then know and they don't, you know, go with someone else's service and, and then just end up losing money because they send traffic that doesn't convert or they send people to the, the campaign and no one backs it. So it's, it's a problem, I think, in the community there. Exactly. A hundred percent. It's basically misrepresentation of our community, right? Um, and we're doing our best from our side in order to fight that issue. Um, we're also, we'll be launching a crowdfunding academy um, and later in the year, a, uh, an academy for small businesses as well, uh, with lots of resources um, on how to launch a crowdfunding campaign as well, um, like how to promote it. Later on, we're going to have courses at the same time. Um, there's going to be like uh, articles uh, about crowdfunding in general. It's all about being, you know, have like being well prepared. You know, we get so many customers uh, that they literally feel like they're going to go on Kickstarter with their idea. Even if their product is, you know, well designed and they're prepared and everything, they just have this feeling that we're going to go live and we're going to get a million dollars. And that's a hundred percent representation, uh, misrepresentation of our market. Um, and we're trying our best in order to, you know, educate our customers from our side as well. I mean, we also send them to your blog, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're doing an amazing job educating the crowdfunding community with your forum, your podcast, your blog. And we always recommend to our customers to read your blog posts, watch your videos. Because truth to be told, truth to be told, uh, they're the most valuable in the market, you know? Oh, thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's always good to hear. For sure, man. A hundred percent. I mean, and it's all about, you know, like informing them and educating them. And I think that's that's something that, you know, we're like the entire market is not doing. It's not, for example, putting 100 percent of the effort in order to improve that. I, it, I don't really talk about this very much, but honestly, it makes me angry when we see some of these different companies that are kind of, quote unquote, taking advantage of people. It's kind of like you get off the bus at Hollywood and someone comes up to you and be like, hey, kid, I'll make you a star. And like you don't know that that person has exactly. their own um, desires and things they're trying to get out of that. And it's hor it, it hurts the crowdfunding community as a whole. When we have more projects that are failing and people that aren't prepared and people that have bad experiences, it hurts crowdfunding as a whole. A hundred percent. And no, it's not just uh, it's not just these companies, right? It's also some of the projects, right? We, how many fraudulent projects like uh, you've you've noticed like just the past year? Yeah. Like yeah, it's not just a handful, right? So that hurts the entire market, uh, and we're doing our best from our side in order to. Uh, fight that as well, right? I mean, we are in touch with Indiegogo's and Kickstarter compliance team. Um, so, you know, if something goes wrong with a campaign, whether that's a trademark dispute or a fraudulent campaign or they just close the entire campaign for whatever reason, we also take action from our side 
within the matter of hours, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of like giving back, that's, that's something that not just our company, but other crowdfunding agencies and companies should pay attention to, you know? Um, cause it's a market that's growing and we're definitely part of it, right? Um, what we do, for example, from our side, we do monthly roundups as a brand and, uh, each and every, uh, employee of our company basically selects for their favorite crowdfunding product. Uh, for from the, the last 30 days that, that went live on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And we basically back that campaign as casual. They're not necessarily our customers, obviously, right? Um, but we feel the urge of like giving back to the community. And mm-hmm. I don't see that a lot from other brands, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I just wish I could see more of it. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think here are the differences between Indiegogo and Kickstarter? Because they've evolved so much since I first got started in 2012. I know since you entered the industry, they've also changed a ton with functionality. Even the community, Kickstarter's openness, these different things. What do you think about the differences between Indiegogo and Kickstarter for a new crowdfunding campaigner? That's a tricky question, right? Um, I know, man. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's why I, I mean, <laughs> I know, right? Um, I mean, it. You know, like they both have their advantages and disadvantages, right? I mean, for um, for a new crowdfunding campaign, I mean, I would recommend like doing your own research, you know, because it all comes down to your market, your niche, and everything. I would say that Indiegogo's theme is kind of more friendly and more approachable in a way, whereas Kickstarter has become this, you know, huge company, right? Um, and they're not necessarily relying on their customer support team. Instead, uh, they're relying on their knowledge base and they just send you on their FAQ. Um, whereas Indiegogo has a much more personalized, as I say, approach. You know, they'll, they'll, work, you, they'll work you through uh, the entire process. They'll help you create your page uh, when it makes sense. Uh, they'll help you get on their newsletters. Um, so I guess, you know, if I could just point out one thing, that's, that, that's basically it. Mm. Are you seeing, uh, for example, certain categories working better on one or the other, or you just you haven't seen any kind of differences in that way? Well, not necessarily. I mean, I'm focused in the hardware and the tech market, right, as well as design. Um, so I would say that you know both platforms perform pretty pretty well in all these categories. Um, one one you know something that we notice from our side is the fact that many of our customers start with Kickstarter. So they basically delivered uh, the Kickstarter community and then they continue with Indigo and Demand campaigns, uh, which is basically, you know, which is something smart because you leverage both platforms this way. Okay. So they can continue to then raise funds under Indiegogo in demand after their, their Kickstarter is finished. Correct. Okay, cool. Um, I, I just want to ask you a few more questions here, and this is kind of just for my own interest because you showed me this this new augmented reality app that you're working on, and I was just blown away. So can, can you talk a little bit about the, the app that you created um, for augmented reality? Like, can you paint a picture, you know, people are listening to this, what, what it's going to be like? Sure thing. So, I mean, it's not just... AR, it's also VR. Um, we've, <laughs> we've recently launched our augmented reality feature for iOS app. Uh, we're using Apple's AR kit and uh, our virtual reality feature for our web version. So you can basically uh, grab your phone where you're like, uh, you know, Google VR, cardboard, uh, or any other VR headset and experience our products in virtual reality. Uh, when it comes to our app, any like for I- iPhone or iPad, uh, you can, we have a, we have a category of products at this point, they're close to 50 or 60 products, uh, that we're working with. And we basically present them in front of you in augmented reality, which is pretty cool. Uh, something interesting as well to mention, uh, today is the fact that we also work with crowdfunding projects. So if you, if you're building like a hardware product, uh, probably chances are that you also have the 3d rendering, right? The files, um, that you've developed. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in the beginning of your, uh, you know, campaign. So you can basically send us those files and we can promote your product as well in, in augmented reality as well in virtual reality, which that is a is totally sick. different experience. Man, that I is know. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, okay, is, yeah. So it's, to paint the picture here, it's like, it's basically you take out your phone and if you wanted to view this product on your desk in front of you, you could just put your phone there and it literally looks like the thing is in front of you. 
Or like if you yep. uh, you had, you know, you're walking into your apartment and you want to see what the chair would look like, or what this blender would look like on your counter, you can just open up the app and you can see on your phone as though you're like taking a picture, except if you were to remove your phone, there'd be nothing there. So it, it looks exactly, exactly like a physical product in your, your space, which is incredible. That's insane that you can do that nowadays. Yeah, it is. And we're so excited about this feature. Our community is so excited as well. Uh, and in terms of like the engagement levels are just over the roof with uh, with this feature. Uh, we've noticed that, for instance, uh, the actual conversion rate in terms of like clicking buy now through the casual listing with the virtual reality reality uh, feature is like at least 60 percent higher compared to not having like the virtual reality feature. Uh, and in terms of the augmented reality, the time on the actual product listing, the time the actual user spends finding out more details about the product or even playing around with the augmented reality uh, feature. Uh, is at least 300% more. Wow. Which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. That is sweet. I mean, I would expect that as well because it's just such more of an immersive experience. It's literally, it's a different UI experience than just watching a video or browsing through text or images. So I, I can totally see that there. Um, I think when it comes to you know marketing these different campaigns, there's certainly the tried and true practices like building an email list, building up a social media following, reaching out to PR influencers, doing Facebook ads, you know, services like yours, et cetera. But what I question is in the future, how are these, th- these new trends going to impact that as well? So things like you mentioned, VR, augmented reality, Kickstarter Live. Um, have you noticed any other trends that you've been watching in this space or even Kickstarter Live? I'd love to get your thoughts on that. So, I mean, it's a great feature. I don't think if, like, the entire community is taking advantage of this feature as of yet. Uh, it's pretty new, right? I mean, it, it came out this year and everything. Um, I personally haven't used it just even once from my side. I've heard my customers, uh, some of our customers used it, and they were not super excited with the results, you know? Mm-hmm. In terms of, like, what, you know, what what's going to happen next in the future, I would say that definitely AR and VR will be super important for every crowdfunding campaign within the next two to three years. It's not it's not ready to be mainstream yet, you know? Because um, simply put, like, there isn't, there isn't, the infrastructure is not there yet. Um, but moving forward, we'll start seeing even more campaigns, for example, offering, like, AR and VR experiences. I, I already know, like, a handful of companies, even based in New York, that they're working on embedding, like, um, virtual reality content, and uh, 3D renderings into crowdfunding campaigns. One of them, my favorite one, is Sketchfab, for example. We're also working with them uh, to basically display products in 3D on, ga- on the gadgetphoto.com on our web version. And it works like a charm, you know? It's a, it's a totally different experience. It's much more engaging. And it's the future, man, 100%. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you for coming on the show today and talking, you know, sharing a little bit about um, what you need to do if you want to launch a successful campaign. Also sharing a little bit of your process with the gadget flow. You know, I imagine a lot of people have heard your sponsorship uh, on this podcast and they're like wondering like, who is this Evan guy? Or like, what, what actually is this platform? So it's great. You can come on, you know, uh, lend a voice to that and sort of Go through also, um, talk, you know, you shared it with us a little bit about your story and all that kind of stuff. So, one thing I do want to ask you so, um, for the people that are listening, it seems like there's a bit of a cue here if you do want to join the Gadget Flow. Also, you might not be approved. So, you have to make sure to, to submit your project ahead of time. Uh, where can people go in order to submit it? And I'll also include a link in the description of this podcast episode. So they can head over to thegadgetflow.com slash submit to basically initiate the submission process. It takes just 30 seconds. We just need your preview URL or your live campaign URL. Uh, and then you'll get redirected to the dashboard and our editorial team will take it from there. I would also like to offer a 15% discount code for uh, your subscribers. The code is Salvador15. Uh, that's going to be available for like lifetime duration. So <laughs> feel free to use it whenever you want. Okay, and so they enter that discount when they're checking out. They click, they click the package there. So it's Salvador15, you said? Correct. Okay, awesome. All right, guys, um, I'll also be, inclu- be including a link to that in the description of this show. But Evan, thank you so much for coming on, sharing all that great info, and we'll have to have you back. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman. Thank you for tuning in to today's podcast episode. If you enjoyed this episode, take a second to rate and subscribe to this show on iTunes. I think Evan shared a, cr- a ton, a crun, <laughs> a ton of great advice and education and tips. And his, his story to me is also really interesting because I think anytime a entrepreneur comes from outside of the United States, you know they, they grow up in, in Greece or Europe or wherever, the, the entrepreneurial culture is very different. So to hear how it is for other people in different areas of the world is always interesting to me. I mean, I also wanted to bring him on because I want you to see a behind the scenes look of his operation. What goes into the gadget flow? What you really get when you sign up with these guys and what you can expect in the way of an ROI. So I try to ask some questions to really help you make that decision whether or not you wanna use these guys to help promote and get the word out there about your Kickstarter or your Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign. If you are interested in gaining access to all of that, you know, this this massive community that he's built up, all the social media followers, sending out an email blast to these people, uh, and also being featured on the front page or being in different sections on the website. If you are interested in that, you can learn more at crowdcrux.com slash the gadget flow. That is C R O W D C R U X dot com slash the gadget flow. And that specific link, I really appreciate if you use that link because if you do go through and you sign up for this service, I will get a tiny commission at no expense to you whatsoever. It's kind of like a thank you, you know, for, for putting out all this education. The podcast episodes, the YouTube videos, the blog posts, etc. If you've gotten any kind of value whatsoever out of this podcast and you want to say thank you, Sal, or you want to return the favor in any form of way, that is a great way to do it because when you go through that link, crowdcrux.com slash the gadget flow, Evan will be able to see that and we can track that and I'll get a small commission. And honestly, I put this back into the show for you guys. You know, I put that into doing things like producing higher quality audio or, or making the website more easy for you to navigate and all these different things. I put the money back into the company to deliver good quality education for you and to make sure we have a bedrock of information out there for people that are also trying to raise money with crowdfunding campaigns on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Thank you for tuning into this episode. Again, my name is Sal and I'll see you next time.